name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
And of course that's true because we don't go into, we go into wars because we think we're right. I remember um, a long time ago reading um, um, someone who did a lot of spiritual writing, Thomas Merton, who was a Trappist monk. And it was during the time of nuclear proliferation. So long before many of your, your lives, but um, certainly in the 60s, um, people were concerned about nuclear armament and proliferation. And um, everybody wanted the, the um, nuclear um, armaments. And Thomas Merton wrote, he said, you know, when somebody, he said the frightening thing, the frightening thing is when somebody eventually presses that button to send off a rocket or whatever, when somebody finally does it, they'll do it because they believe it's the right thing to do. And that's a frightening thing about human beings. Um, and, and so there is this extraordinary conflict in the, in the middle of the Middle East. And it's a pressure on, on the rest of the world. But I'm very conscious that in our own conversations, our own social life, um, our own country here, and its politics and so on, people have been asked to take sides all the, all the time. Um, and it's, a, an extra, it is, it's as if we've almost imported this conflict. Um, into our living rooms. And it's a, a, a it really is a, 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 a difficult time. And I try to remind myself um, that I'm a Christian, that I'm somebody who is going to look at things um, differently. I'm going to look at it from the perspective of my, my faith. And I think because the conflict is so much of what we understand as the Holy Land, has been part of our history and part of our scriptural readings and our background and, and so on. Uh, we, we, it's, a, it's a very strongly religious aspect to it and, and there are a number of uh, religions born out of that territory. So it's interesting just to look at the geography of it. And so there's, there's Jerusalem, um, and there, there, um, there are other holy sites and places there in Israel. But our faith is born of someone who's not in Jerusalem, but who died on a cross outside of Jerusalem. And I think in the midst of this conflict, as we as we caught, we, we need to look at our faith. Why? Why is that person on the outside? Why? What what was the story? What's that narrative? And I think as we approach the Christ on that cross, we we might find a different perspective, a, an alternative way forward. It's, a, it's alternative to what is in existence, but in reality it ought to be what is normal. And so we need to stay in all of this time close to what we understand of our faith. And that's what's going to carry us forward through the changes and the turbulence um, and all, all that is actually happening to us. And I think the other characteristic about, about our time and our ages is just how the leadership of the world is not coping. Um, there's, we, we're, there isn't the guidance that we ought to be getting. And people seem to be simply going for themselves and seeking themselves and terrified of opinion and losing power and so on. The, one of the, the poems which has always been meaningful to me, but which I've heard 
quoted frequently in the secular environments, in interviews that I've um, listened to on, on the internet and elsewhere. It's a, it's a poem that some of you may, may be familiar with it, and it's William Butler Yeats who wrote The Second Coming. I don't know if any of you are aware of that. But it was a poem, poem he wrote just after the First World War, beginning um, um, of last century. And it was a time of anarchy, it was a time of chaos, it was a time of turbulence. And he used words which I, I find extremely meaningful um, today. And he said, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And for me, that's something of what the, is happening at the moment, with all the realignments um, and all the adjustments that countries are making and so on. It's this, this feeling that things, there's nothing, there's no one single thing that holds it together. And he talks too of um, the kind of people that were there, and he talks about how um, um, good people, the best, he says, lack all conviction, while the, the worst are full of passionate intensity. And again, I think we're facing that kind of reality. So hold on to the things that you have, because the, the answers are not going to be immediately in things structural, um, in institutions that we were familiar with. There's going to be change. And you have to look to what is in your faith, the rock you have built upon. And Jesus tells that parable about building on the rock for a very specific reason. And he says, this is, this is what happens when you don't build on rock. You know, the sea comes and the wind comes and it washes the building away. And the house built on rock stays. And that's our image for our, our, own, our own faith and what we trust in, what we believe in. So we're putting our trust in the rock, um, in the rock of Christ. He is our foundation. That's what we get. So your prayer life, all those practical things, um, and your scripture reading, your being here in church, really very, very important in terms of the, the kind of turbulence that's washing over the, the world. Don't, don't let us go of that. Um, there's a, a book I, I recently read, and I read it because I watched the, um, the what they call a limited episode, a limited series, I think, TV. And the title of the book, and you might recognize it from television, um, is all, all the Light We Can Never See. All the Light We Can Never See. Have you, did you see that? Um, television? It's one of Netflix movies. Do watch it if, if you can. The book is actually a lot better. So, so this, what I'm going to say now is a bit of a spoiler. So you can put your head under the pew. But it's a story based in the Second World War, and it's of um, a young blind girl, French blind girl, and um, a young German um, boy. And the young girl is, um, her life begins in, in, in Paris, and her father is a very caring and loving mother who's died. Um, and he feels very responsible for her. And he works in the Nas Natural History Museum. And before she goes blind, he teaches her everything that he possibly can. And um, is extraordinarily helpful to her when she does go blind, because uh, she wasn't born blind. Um, and in terms of understanding some of the beauty of the world and the extraordinary things in the world, and the, the young German person, young German boy, he comes from a, a mining town um, in Germany, and he's an orphan. 
and um, he and his sister had grown up in an orphanage where, um, which they're very fortunate, they're looked after very kindly by a particular individual. And it's, it's a, I mean, most of these stories, the orphanages are, are the dreadful, are dreadful places, but this is a place with a very loving, loving atmosphere. And he discovers, or he comes across, he stumbles across a radio, a broken radio, um, in as much as radios existed in those days. And he learns how to fix it. He, bec he becomes fascinated by it and very competent in it. And he actually gains a reputation about it. But when the Nazi German, the Nazi, um, Hitler's Nazi Germany comes into power and um, the military starts, um, and, and the war actually starts, um, he's, he's conscripted. And he's taken off to one of Hitler's academy schools um, to be trained further and, and so on. And uh, the descriptions of um, how that all happens, and the violence related to it, and the propaganda, cruelty, the brutality of it um, are, are, are quite devastating. But he goes through that and he learns as much as he possibly can about, about radio. And, and the story is one of those ones where you, you, know, you start with two people in different places and gradually their stories um, come, come together um, towards the end of the but the, the reality of it is that in the lives of these two people, there's a light. There's that which illumines other people. And those things are just simple values from home or from human relationships in their lives at some point or another. Those are the things which deeply um, uh, live within them and which enable them to make decisions or um, stop short of um, becoming something else um, in, in the meantime, or acquiescing like the young boy, acquiescing to the propaganda. And that's the story of the people in their lives and, and, and so on. But it's, but the fascinating thing is, is that it's, it's that which is their resident in their life from the beginning. So all these huge forces um, roll over them um, and lap up against the places that they live, like waves, and, and crash over, but they remain essentially who they are and the values that um, they believe in. And that's our story as well. We may not be politicians, or this, or that, or whoever, but we are people of faith. We are people who believe and, and, and trust in the God that um, loves us. Just to, to reflect for a moment on the, on the Gospel reading, which is about John the Baptist, and uh, there's some verses just before that which we didn't read, but which is a quotation from um, the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet who lived some um, 800 years before the time of Christ. And, um, but the history of those, those words is actually fascinating. Um, and it's, um, those words, if you, if you remember them, are um, you know, the voice of someone crying in the wilderness, um, make way the straight, the, make way, uh, make straight the way of the Lord. And, and that's used 800 years further on in, to describe what John the Baptist is. John the Baptist is all about. And, but in the 800 years earlier, um, Israel, um, Palestine, if you remember, if you think now of all the maps you've seen on television about the Middle East and that particular country, exists between um, countries in the north and countries.
countries in the south. And they were continually being subjected by um, countries in the north, nations in the north, that would come down expanding their kingdoms um, and walk all over them. And, and similarly from Egypt in the south. So in the north there were countries like Syria, and Babylon, um, and um, the Medes, and the Persians, and, and so on. And it's very interesting if you look at the history of that time, the way that those countries actually handled um, Palestine. And what they would do what the, um, was that they would take all the leadership um, from the country and they would take it into exile. And the exile was a huge um, moment in the history of Israel. And they would go off into exile and the, those countries would then put in place their own um, countrymen uh, to rule um, Palestine. Except when it came to the Persians, and um, there was a king by the name of Cyrus, and he didn't want to spend all his energy having to look after foreign countries. So he adopted a different policy. He took the exiles, he took all the Jewish people who were there, and he said, you can go back to Jerusalem. And of course they saw that as the hand of God. And there are these wonderful verses in Isaiah that says, Every valley shall be lifted up. You know, in the valleys like that, but it shall be lifted up. And every mountain shall be made low. So there's this wonderful scene of an absolutely straight road from exile back to Jerusalem. And and, and that's the history of those passages. And John in the New Testament, John the Baptist, is seen as the messenger that proclaims that. And he uses um, the word repentance. That's his instrument for raising up the valleys and bringing down the mountains. Repent. That's, that's, that's how it's done. And it leads us directly to Jesus Christ, who stands, he says, he's not fit to untie. Um, and Jesus um, will come, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The other word which occurs in all of that is the word prepare, prepare the way. And that's part of repentance, is part of that preparation. And preparation is just so, so important. I've been reading a book which my son gave me for Christmas called Russi. Um, if any of you play rugby, you will know who Russi is. He's the director of Springbok Rugby. And to win the World Cup, they start four years before. Um, that's what they, that's how they get to where they, where they do. I mean, their preparation. It's 99% preparation. And the same thing applies to our spiritual lives. The same thing applies. That our lives are lives of preparation. One of the common things, one of the common themes in our gospel is that um, Jesus, the light of the world, um, the word of God, came to his own. Remember John's gospel came to his own, and his own did not recognize him. And what preparation is for us, is that it makes us more receptive to receiving and seeing that um, which is of God. So it's vital for us um, to, to be in that place. And it's a grace. And we will a few minutes to our communion and we will um, take to ourselves the body of Christ, and the blood of Christ, we will say those words, we will stretch out our hands. Um, hold on to that. Hold on to those experiences. Trust 
the things God is saying to you. Believe in them. Allow them to form the things in your life. So, so when those waves come your way, and you are strong and you know, 